Welcome to the first 40 years of a lifelong journey. My mother delighted in reading fairy tales to me when I was growing up. My favorite was always the haunting story of Little Red Riding Hood. It taught me that food was more than sustenance. Food was also a means of controlling others and protecting oneself from predators. Food could distract the enemy. You could safely hide behind food. Food was power. We have 15 rooms, 33 house guests. Yeah, every day I'm just trying to survive and keep the wolves at bay and not be eaten. Five stayovers, 17 anniversaries, 17 birthdays, 25 tables in the first, 71 guests. One of my old chef mentors used to say that if you wanted to succeed in the restaurant business, you had to put your whole soul into it. Don't move the popcorn with the plate. You lift it, set it to the side. Okay. And put this down. I yeah. can do that. Okay, good. So anything we do has to be extraordinary. I mean, that's the standard to which I hold myself. So please be ready at 5.30, yes? Yes, chef. I've gotten very comfortable with not knowing what the ultimate strategy, vision, or plan is. Of course, the inn as we see it was a gas station. That building at one time was a brothel, and normal developer would have torn it down. It's a little like doing a big canvas. You paint a little bit, and then you're guided by what you've done to the next, and it just opens up. I think if you know the origin story, as it were, him teaching himself how to cook, traveling to Europe, and then coming back to a town that was literally in the middle of nowhere and deciding this is where he was going to open a restaurant. This little bit of luxury in the tiny town 70 miles southwest of Washington, D.C., right in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's ridiculous. I mean, I, it's like Little Red Riding Hood. It's like a Disney movie. You go and all the animals are coming out of the woods and stuff. There's no cell phone service. The whole town is basically the inn of Washington. You know, spaghetti and meatball restaurants don't last 39 years, let alone a Michelin-rated restaurant. I mean, it's unbelievable how it continues to evolve. We got a little carried away, and one end of the building disappeared. So it looks like a little dollhouse with a side missing. Joy Sevens, the interior designer. She sounds like your fairy godmother. So much going on, I don't know how you keep up with it, or oh, it's a miracle. We chase after it. We're always in a swirl. She's a true magician. She's able to go into a trance, envision the room in great detail. That's wonderful. And I, I shall get my drawing in the fax machine tomorrow morning. Terrific. Bye. Bye. It's part of the fairy tale. This place is a set, and there's a play going on. 24 hours a day. And you quickly realize you're a character in the play. <laughs> The sense of humor is so deeply ingrained here. Cowabunga. Meals on wheels. You know, there's a level of professionalism. So this is Farah. These are Farah's faucets at the bottom. Then there's a line you don't cross. We figured we'd just milk it for all it's worth. <laughs> but it can't be stuffy. And I always point out that we do have a dress code, and that is no wet bikinis. I have no problem with dry bikinis at all. The wet, it gets on the velvet. The business never stops. There's always something going on. Making beds, cleaning toilets. Phones are ringing all day long. I do everything. <laughs> Where's, oh, my tea. Oh, my God. It's freezing in here, Bob. I'm frozen. Oh, God, what's up? You create some drama by doing the impossible. You cut the Parmesan like a coal miner in a good way. Yes. Everybody's always trying to outperform the other to separate yourself. There's a little competition between when we're putting up dishes to chef. The yes, chef. The other way it makes it look cheap and nasty. <laughs> we have a battle. You have a layer of jelly. Whose dish is going to be better? Whose dish is going to get approved? Sometimes you both lose, and sometimes someone comes on top. And I mean, you know. It's a nice lunch dish for uh, people over. 65. The expectation of perfection comes from Patrick. Everything has to be correct. You do another tweel, no pepper, foie, rhubarb, and crust the outside with pepper. I think it would be more interesting if it were a pure tweel. Absolutely, Chef. We grew up on Mrs. Paul's fish sticks, on Stouffer's uh, lasagna. So I realized what my cuisine was really all about. I was taking my childhood, cherished flavor memories and bringing them forward. 
elevating them to something that ideally could rest side by side with a dish that was on a Michelin three-star French menu, and it was making something out of nothing, taking shit and turning it into Shinola. It's either art or garbage. There's nothing in between. We can't have it close. It doesn't work that way. One six, be fast. I realized that I didn't relate to food exactly the way other people did. 26, 26. beef and bath. Food and sex were really all one to me. But that's the sense of fulfillment that we look for. With orgasm, it's a little death. This is like that too. I liken it to falling down flight after flight of stairs, losing control. Just shut up and lose yourself. There's no greater satisfaction than finding a calling worthy of your whole soul. And I feel fortunate to have found such an endeavor and to know that it manages to provide pleasure to so many others. It's a life's journey without a destination. Walking alone, a song. Can feel the cold with you beside me. Cynical friends sometimes refer to it as a life sentence with no parole but it's a delicious one. should have worn my Little Red Riding Hood outfit. <laughs> I think the four other properties here today that have all been open more than 40 years should get together with me and go out for a drink tonight. <laughs> or two, or three. So how old were uh, all of you in 1978? <laughs> and what were you wearing? But more importantly, what were you eating? Velveeta cheese. I can only imagine. I sometimes think that the best and the worst thing that ever happened to me was that I got a job in a restaurant at the age of 15. The addiction was immediate. Once I discovered the intensity of this delicious business, I was hooked. But more than anything, I fell in love with restaurant people. They always seemed to be paying a debt they didn't owe. And in those days, the business... <laughs> I thought I was the only one who would get that. <laughs> We're all alike. <laughs> In that era, the business was a safe haven for misfits of every persuasion who all seemed to have a whacked sense of humor and a genuine appreciation for the absurdities of life. And because restaurant people were capable of operating in two distinct worlds, out front in the dining room and in back, behind the scenes in the kitchen, they made normal people seem one-dimensional and infinitely boring by comparison. Every day I felt like I was watching a split-screen film with two shows running simultaneously, the fantasy taking place in the dining room juxtaposed with what was going on behind the scenes in the rough-and-tumble world of the kitchen. I've been trapped in that film for a long time. <laughs> I'm ad still addicted to that film. Uh, <clears throat> Of course, I went to college to pacify my parents and planning to enter some sort of field, maybe in the theater. But I soon found that the living theater of the restaurant world was much more compelling and the than the stage, and it offered a much-needed connection to the real world, and it contributed to my remaining somewhat sane. So I dropped out of college because it was interfering with my restaurant work. 
I'd saved up enough money to take a trip to Europe. But before I left, a wise friend who was trying to organize a utopian community in the mountains of Virginia convinced me to buy a small plot of land in the country so I'd have a place to come home to and not spend every last cent I'd saved while traveling. <clears throat> so I found a shack on three acres for $1,000. Miles off the main road, way back in a hollow, occupied by one mountain family, and they were feuding. <laughs> it was a modest starter home that included an outhouse, five wrecked cars in the front yard, and a school bus attached to the rear. <laughs> I learned later that in Appalachia, when a young lady finds herself with child, daddy usually volunteers a little parcel of land on the corner of his property, and then has a talk with the young man, shotgun not far away, and the young man is expected to drag something as a starter home to the property. Sometimes it's an old wrecked car, um, a piece of corrugated tin. In this case, it was a stumpy school bus. And that served as the kitchen of the house. So knowing I had a little piece of earth to come home to, I happily went off to explore Europe on $5 a day. And observing the food culture in France at that time was eye-opening. At home, restaurants still conjured up images of maraschino cherries and waitresses with hairnets padding around in white-soled shoes with a pencil stuck in their ear. But in Paris, I watched crowds gather around pastry shop windows with their noses pressed against the glass, swooning over the creations. I could sense the reverence and respect for the culinary arts that hadn't yet blossomed here at home. France convinced me that cooking was an artistic pursuit that could utilize all of my talents. So a year later, I returned home more intrigued than ever with food and restaurants. So I sold my shack to some hippies who promptly added a geodesic dome onto the side of it. <laughs> I wish I had a picture. <clears throat> and I bought a larger farm on the other side of the mountain. My new farmhouse had no heat. So I spent a lot of time in the library of the nearest town, soaking up the central heat all afternoon. And at night, I'd bring home cookbooks and keep warm by baking on the wood stove. I cooked night and day. It was the beginning of an uncontrollable obsession. Friends joked that I'd cook anything I could get my hands on. Even pets weren't safe. <laughs> there were often 12 or 13 people at the table including lost hikers from the Shenandoah National Park. And soon, everybody began saying, you should open a restaurant. But as a preliminary step, we opened a catering business out of the farmhouse, using only the wood-burning cook stove and an electric frying pan we bought at a yard sale for $1.89. Many memorable disasters convinced us that we should make our clients come to us. So on January 28, 1978, 40 years ago, during the worst blizzard of the decade, the Inn at Little Washington opened for business in a defunct garage in a town of 133 souls. Our rent was $200 a month. Dinner was $4.95. The nearest grocery store was 30 miles away. Nothing was delivered except milk and 75 people showed up the first night. <clears throat> and during the second week, we were visited anonymously by the restaurant critic of a major newspaper in Washington, D.C. On his way out, he asked to speak to me, and he said, I never do this, but I'm going to introduce myself because I have to ask you if you really want me to write about this place. The reason I'm asking is that if I write this review, it might change your whole life. Well, you might have to hire someone just to answer the telephone, because I'm going to say this place is fantastic, and I'm worried for you. <laughs> His review came out the following Sunday, 
and the first line read, once in a great while, there comes along a restaurant so good you worry. And he went on to proclaim it the best restaurant in a radius of 150 miles of Washington. His concerns were well-founded. <laughs> By noon, there were already about 30 people gathered on the front porch, and we didn't open until 4 p.m. <clears throat> the crowd began throwing themselves against a side door, secured only by a little dime store deadbolt, and it looked as though they'd break through in a matter of minutes and come flooding into the room. I felt I was in the middle of a very scary dream, and I began chopping the onions faster than I thought humanly possible. <laughs> so every night, uh, I'd make a shopping list, and after service, my partner would drive our Dodge Dart into the DC market for provisions. The markets opened at midnight, and he'd pick up the food and sleep a few hours in a friend's basement before returning. And it was a bit more than bizarre that most of our guests drove an hour and a half out of the city to dine with us and an hour and a half back while we drove an hour and a half into the city <laughs> and an hour and a half back to, 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 with the food to cook it. Something was definitely out of whack with that picture. So of necessity, we began to cultivate a network of local farmers and purveyors who could supply us with the products we needed. <clears throat> everybody in the community had a garden and went mushroom hunting in the spring, and every housewife canned and pickled things. And there was certainly no shortage of Virginia ham. So by shopping and foraging at home, we were able to offer our guests delicacies they couldn't get anywhere else in the world. A regional cuisine was born out of necessity, not because it was chic. When I was growing up, I spent every summer with my grandmother in the Midwest. She was a resourceful housewife who seemed to be capable of making something out of nothing. So I regarded her as a magician. A reassuring sense of self-sufficiency permeated her house. Just outside her kitchen door was a strawberry patch, an old apple tree, a little grape arbor. Rhubarb grew alongside the picket fence. An Aunt Jemima cookie jar always seemed to be full of oatmeal and peanut butter cookies. Curiously, our kitchen at the restaurant feels a lot like my grandmother's. Her breakfast nook inspired our kitchen table seating. One night, a journalist asked me after I'd had a couple of beers how I might describe my restaurant, and I said I wanted it to feel just like going to grandmother's if grandma dropped acid once in a while. I think she did anyway. <laughs> it was a different era, I'm telling you, you have no idea. <laughs> I always say life was simpler during those days. <clears throat> I, I tell my cooks, in that era, the challenges were different. You had to get the hot food hot and the cold food cold. And be nice to them, and then they'd come back. <laughs> it's slightly different now. In the business of restoration, which I prefer to call it rather than the restaurant business, one of my early inspirations was a legendary French chef named Fernand Pointe. And he'd say that he wanted each dining experience at his place to be a little marvel, a gorgeous scene from the film of your life. And he defined success as the sum of a lot of small things correctly done. One statement he made which struck a chord with me was that if you even begin to think about money in this business, you're finished before you start. And this pronouncement was as heretical then as it is now. But if restoration is to be viewed as art, it really can't be entered into with the primary object of making money. If a diner is coming to you seeking a magical interlude, a time out from the concerns of harsh reality, and he perceives a common business transaction taking place, the illusion will be shattered. I often remind our staff that once the guest realizes 
that money is not our foremost concern, it won't be his either, and he'll happily stop worrying about the cost. Only then can he truly enjoy the experience. Mimi Sheridan, the former New York Times restaurant critic, who might be here today, uh, once said that what a diner is buying when he goes to a restaurant is not a plate of food, but the right to be a part of the living theater, which is that restaurant on any given evening. With our team, we try to focus on the ultimate potential of a dining experience and point out that like a great play or work of art, a magical evening in a restaurant can and should be life-changing. And like a theatrical production, the living theater of the restaurant is an art form in which everyone's role is interdependent. For the diner, it's an interactive dance where they get to play a starring role. In 1978, on the back cover of our very first menu, I wrote a brief message thanking our guests for making the journey to Little Washington and telling the story of the first restaurant, tracing the route of restaurant to its origins as a place selling fortifying broths and restoratives. I went on to say that I hoped we could live up to the original meaning of our title as restaurateurs and restore them a bit while they were here. Even then, I knew I was not so much in the business of feeding people as I was in restoring and healing them. I've always believed in the primitive theory that every human has a geographic spot in the universe where they belong. And if they're lucky enough to find their spot, everything will fall into place and they'll flourish. I believe this because I found my spot and knew immediately that the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia is where I belonged. As soon as I came there, I felt grounded and I wanted to share this healing sanctuary that I discovered with others. Every night, guests ask me why I chose to locate an inn like this in the middle of nowhere. And I tell them the story of passing through the little village of Washington, Virginia, as a small child in the backseat of our 1954 Ford with my family as we drove over the mountain to have Sunday dinner in the country. The whole way out in the car, while my brothers horsed around and punched each other, I'd crouch down in the corner of the back seat and put my nose in the window like a dog does, smelling the country air and playing my favorite game. The game never really had a name and I never told anybody about it because it was sort of like magic. By holding up one finger in front of my eyes as the car glided down the road, I erased anything that I thought was ugly making it disappear and returning the area to virgin forest as if the eyesore never existed. I wiped out miles of crappy stuff. <laughs> Sometimes I worried about disappearing people's houses and trailers and the surprise on their faces when they returned home to find not a trace of where they used to live. I also worried about small children who might be inside those houses watching TV. <laughs> I was never sure what became of them. You can just imagine the Catholic guilt I had to cope with. <laughs> I obliterated whole towns. But I always felt certain that I was benefiting the greater good since I regarded ugliness as a kind of painful blight if I saw something worth saving quick as lightning, I could drop my finger, allowing what I deemed beautiful or worthy to remain. A few years back, I was restoring one of our buildings in the town, and for a moment, I caught myself holding one finger in the air, attempting to erase from my sight an eyesore in the background, and then it hit me. I was still playing the finger game from my childhood, only now I was doing it in reality. In the lifelong process of transforming a garage into a country house hotel and a small village into a picturesque hamlet, I've had to obliterate a lot of trash. 
but I believe that beauty can be a healing life force. It certainly contributes to our being able to cast a spell over our guests and put them in the right frame of mind to fully appreciate our culinary efforts. We regard our work as restaurateurs in its highest sense to be a healing art form. We may not always realize this goal, but I believe it's enough if the guests can sense what you're aiming for, whether you achieve it or not. Carl Jung, the famous psychoanalyst, once said that the role of a good therapist is to be there for what is. Curiously, this also defines the role of a good waiter. He becomes a participant observer in a memorable moment in someone's life, their therapist for the evening. Early in life, I realized that I didn't experience the world exactly the way others did. Everything seemed exaggerated. Much later, I heard this condition referred to euphemistically as amplified sensation. But I like the idea of turning liabilities into assets and have learned to regard heightened sensitivity as a gift. An old Leonard Cohen song teaches, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. All of us have our cracks and our flaws. In Japanese culture, when a fine ceramic bowl breaks, it's sometimes mended with gold emphasizing the crack with a beautiful line, adding an additional layer of interest and a rich narrative to the piece. This illustrates a philosophy not of replacement, but of awe, reverence, and restoration. This art called golden joinery often makes the repaired piece even more beautiful than the original, revitalizing it with new life. For the past 40 years, I've been attempting to combine the disciplines of theater, the culinary arts, and psychology in the creation of a unique restorative sanctuary, a stage set for a magical interlude out of time and place where worldly cares can be suspended, our faith in humanity restored, and the art of living celebrated. Curiously, the word heal comes from the same root as whole and holiness. To restore someone to wholeness, it's necessary to address the whole self, not just the stomach. A successful dining experience is capable of increasing a person's self-esteem and can change the way they feel about life. A guest simply has to feel that you care even more than he does about his welfare, and that in a spiritual sense, his divinity is acknowledged. A few years back, I was chatting with a couple of doctors who were dining in my kitchen. We began talking about the state of the medical profession today. I asked if things were getting better or worse. Reluctantly, they said, worse. A few days later, I received an invitation from them to speak to a group of doctors at Washington Hospital Center. I was very surprised that they wanted to hear from a restaurateur chef and did not expect them to be overly receptive. But this encounter was the beginning of a fascinating association with the medical community, during which I realized how eager they were to learn more about customer service and hospitality especially now that their profession was being rated and evaluated the same way as restaurants, with online reviews. They'd been caught off guard by the fact that in Yelp ratings of medical practices, low scores often have little to do with the success of a medical procedure, but they're actually more affected by how patients are dealt with personally. A parallel situation exists with us in the restaurant business. It's expected these days that the food will be extraordinary, just as when they visit a doctor, they trust that the surgical procedures performed will be flawless. But what they remember most 
are the unexpected, thoughtful little details which make the overall memory of the experience so exceptional. How you make them feel is what they tell their friends about and why they choose to return. The doctors and their support staffs desperately needed to learn the art of hospitality. It became obvious to me that restaurants and the medical community are in parallel fields. We share a common origin. Hospital and hospitality come from the same root word. The word hospital comes from the Latin word hospitalia, which means a lodging place for strangers and guests. The first hospital was the Hospice de Bon in France, founded in 1443. It was called the Hotel of God, which I think is a wonderful name for a hotel. I'm going to use it one day. Early hospitalias provided more hospitality than medical care, but as time went by, medical treatment gradually played a bigger role. Science entered the picture, and the human touch gave way to the laboratory. The two fields of hospitality and medicine began to take different paths. My work with physicians has convinced me that it's time to bring them back together again. If we assess the disintegration of our culture over the last 50 years, we become aware that we've witnessed a death of all things sacred. Religions are failing many of us in their attempts to provide guidance and solace and are now seen as businesses which can no longer be trusted or believed in. Government has become a cartoon. Everything is becoming the opposite of what it says it is. Food seems to be the one thing that can't lie. It's either wonderful or awful, like a kiss. There's nothing in between. It's one of the most intimate and primal connections we have to the earth and to our survival. By default, restaurants are becoming the last bastions of trust. They're replacing churches as places of restoration. Chefs sometimes regret that nothing tangible remains of our work, but memories of the palate can last a lifetime. All of us store them away in the cupboards of our mind and portion them out when needed to provide us with emotional sustenance. They allow us to recall delicious moments in time and remind us that life is still worth living. It's often said that people reflect on their greatest meals while on their deathbeds. A few weeks back, a couple came into my kitchen. Every diner has a story to tell, and we try to make space for them to tell their stories while they're with us. Anyhow, they had gone to see her mother in the nursing home before coming to dinner, and she had Alzheimer's and was at a point where she couldn't even remember her own daughter. So the daughter began telling her that they were heading out to the inn for dinner. And suddenly, her mother began describing every dish she'd eaten on her own last visit to the inn many years before. Her daughter was astonished. So was I. Late in her life, my own mother came to live in a cottage on our campus where she could enjoy or complain about room service. <laughs> I was driving in a blizzard <clears throat> one evening. I had gone into D.C. and I couldn't see because of the snow. <clears throat> and the phone rang in the car and it was mom. And she said, my dinner is late. And I said, what time did you order it? She said, 6 p.m. I said, it's four minutes after six. And she said, I ordered it at six. It should have been here at six. I said, mom, there's a blizzard going on they're probably digging a tunnel from the kitchen <laughs> to your front door. She said, they should have anticipated that before coming. 
So one afternoon I stopped in to check in on her. And in 91, she never any longer felt any obligation to censor herself. I'm going to get there one day. <laughs> so unrelated to anything, she looked up at me from her heated Lazy Boy recliner and she started gesturing with the remote control. Damn it, Pat, she said. You've worked harder than anybody I've ever known just so you wouldn't ever have to get a real job. <laughs> I was stunned, but as always, she was right. I had found a clever way to avoid ever having to lead a normal life, and somehow I'd managed to survive while doing it. This wonderful forum reassures us that we're not alone in exploring our passions, and it, it inspires us to be less fearful of life's journey. We need to be reminded that each of us has a gift to share and that there will always be an appreciative audience waiting to receive it. So thank you, Will, Anthony, and Brian, for creating and hosting such a wonderful event. I'm so pleased to be part of it and doubly pleased that I never, ever got a real job.